Hey, Tom, how are you doing? Hey, Jason. Great to see you. Good to Wish see we you could again. have doing this in person. <laughs> I, you know, I think I can look out the window and see your building. <laughs> yeah, just over the river, that's true. Just over the river, super close. So from Brooklyn to New York. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in today. We're going to wait a few minutes or a couple minutes to uh, let people log in. And <clears throat> so, yeah, it's nice that it's actually really nice out. I can't wait to start getting out. At least here in New York. So uh, it's uh, it's been, it was a pretty intense winter. I, I enjoyed the snow, but I am ready now for the change of season to get some uh, Get some sun out, get some grilling going. Well, part of the intensity was that you did have your first child, right? Well, yes. So <laughs> say that's a throw one. on quarantine, you throw on protests, and then you have a baby. I've had a very busy uh, or traumatic <laughs> 2020. <laughs> yeah, this is easy compared to all that. <clears throat> see can i see but i'm excited also i got my vaccine scheduled for thursday so uh that's gonna be a step in the right direction that's great i still have to wait i think another 70 days because i had covid a few weeks ago so i'm um, glad that's over and uh but I, I can't wait to get the vaccine but apparently i have to wait a little while yeah well glad you came out of it smoothly. yeah me too all right, so we've got a decent number of people in. I think that we might be able to get started. Yeah. Should we wait a little bit longer? Or? One minute. You... One minute. All right. So where's your favorite place to go on a motorcycle run in the East Coast? Yeah, so yeah, right before we got started, was... And saying to Jason that we're gonna have to go for a motorcycle ride now that it's warming up. Um, at least from Manhattan, I think one of my favorite rides is going up to Mount Bear Mountain, uh, which is about two hours north um, on the west side of the Hudson. Yeah. Go up the new, uh, what is it called? New Paltz? Yeah, past New Paltz, but like there's a there's a road, highway in Jersey, really pretty, a lot of like is that the seven park? seven mile or seven lake road seven yeah lake um, lane, something like that that's a good ride that's a good one then you go up to the top of uh, bear mountain and uh, take a look at view at all the trees and head back to the city that sounds good all right well if you're tuning in you want to go for a motorcycle run uh let us know <laughs> maybe we'll get a little pack together <laughs> all right let's get this started all right um so welcome everyone thank you for tuning in i know there's a lot to do out there so appreciate your time and and uh attention uh my name is jason oates i'm chief business officer and a founding executive over at live intent um a little bit on live intent just in case you're not aware of who we are uh live intent we brought together you know the best of advertising technology and we brought that to the world's most powerful marketing engine ever created from our perspective which is email uh, we created the largest logged in media channel outside of Facebook, and Google and Amazon in North America. And so we make it possible for both small and large brands. And we're talking about companies like, you know, Thrive Cosmetics, Wayfair, Simply Safe and Domino's. We make it possible for them to reach over 200 million people in North America as those people actually consume email. We're talking about email newsletters, alerts, announcements and transactional emails. And these emails aren't sent by us. They're sent by over 2,000 publishers and big brands um, on a monthly basis or a daily basis. And these publishers and brands are like New York Times, Fanatics, Meredith, and Condé Nast, Kraft, and General Mills. And since ads are only delivered once an email is opened and images are turned on, we can verify that every impression is targeted and optimized towards a real person. Um, now, we're also taking these learnings and leveraging people-based mar our people-based marketing acumen um, beyond the email channel with our identity offerings. And our goal is to bring identity resolution to both publishers and advertisers who want to thrive in a post-cookie, post-third-party cookie world. That's enough on Live Intent and myself, Tom, take it away.
Well, first of all, I want to thank you for joining me today, uh, Jason. It was a great conversation. And I'm Tom Berg, uh, founder and CEO of Tower Data. Uh, now in our 20th year, uh, Tower Data is a data technology company to make it fast, easy, and safe for marketers to get the data they need to understand and engage with the person behind the email address. We provide email validation to ensure that a customer's email is valid and authentic. We provide demographic and behavioral information through our email intelligence service to fill out customer profiles and contextualize a customer's relationship with brands. We also provide any matching services to help customers, marketers connect customers across channel. And in short, we're providing the fuel necessary for marketers and technology partners to deliver people-based marketing powered by accurate, complete, and connected information about people. I think it probably good that we start off by making sure everyone's on the same page and understand, talk about what is people-based marketing. How would you describe it, Jason? Um, I, th I think that the best way of describing it is really it is all about people. It's the people that actually are consuming the content being, you know, created by the best, you know, some of the best publishers uh, in the world. And also the people that are being delivered, you know, advertising and marketing from the best brands in the world. So, but what makes people-based marketing so powerful um, is it allows the brands and marketers to reach real people, not pixels and proxies, but actually the real people. Um, and you know, when you think about people-based marketing, logged in media channels, addressable media, they're all about the same thing. And what brings them together is that they're using that, that, that they're targeting, you know, a person's email address, or at least a hashed version of it, a, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, an anonymized version of that email address to protect that information um, as the main identifier used for targeting and optimization and attribution which is a lot more powerful than using inaccurate proxies like a third party cookie. Now, you know, this is why the walled gardens are so powerful. When you look at, you know, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, they've performed exceedingly well. Amazon's the fastest growing media company ever created. And a lot of that is because it, they are people-based. Um, people are logged in all the time. They can leverage the email address, which is a deterministic ID, meaning they know who that person is. And that's why these three powerhouses, these gardens, walled gardens, you know, gain about 70% of all digital ad spend. Now, um, what's important to realize, you don't have to be a walled garden to be a great people-based marketer or a people-based marketing platform. Uh, the industry, I believe, has an amazing opportunity to build beautiful gardens that are open, that are transparent, that are welcoming, and treat consumers better than expected uh, while protecting their privacy. So that's all I got to say about that. I think you know that helps us all kind of set our expectations of what we're talking about in terms of people-based marketing. And um, I think the first question we wanted to to you know go into is what role does people-based or does data play in creating compelling people-based marketing campaigns? Yeah, I mean, getting to your point, Jason, of recognizing people, I mean, data, where data comes in, it starts by creating that single view of a customer. In order to deliver the right message to someone at different stages of their buyer journey, right. you have to recognize that customer when they interact with you at those different stages, and you need the right data to do that. So identity resolution allows marketers to identify individual consumers across the devices or channels they're using to interact with your brand. For example, for Lucky Jeans, uh, we help them link the names and postal addresses of people that visit their stores with the corresponding emails on their list. That way they can see when an email drove a purchase in the store and then update their messaging after the purchase had been made. With people-based marketing, you want to break down those different channel silos and avoid having customers have different experiences when they different interact with you in different places. So try, you know, you're working to create a consistent and coherent experience across all your different touch points. Because you don't want to treat your best customers like strangers. You know, some, you know another example is for an e-tailer of outdoor products or helping them to recognize customers that have returned to their website but don't log back in. By doing this, we're enabling them to retrieve the context of prior interactions that they've had with that customer, and then they can also trigger abandoned browser bound cart messages. Jason, where do you see data coming in uh, to people-based marketing equation? Yeah, I mean, I think that you nailed it. It's really around having a, a single view of the customer. Um, 
you know, I like that you talked about, you know, don't treat your best customers like strangers. I think that's actually a really important, you know, uh, perspective. And, you know, to achieve that single view, uh, I think most companies have realized that they need to have multiple identifiers around a person. Um, a lot of people call this a customer graph or an ID graph. Um, and, you know, th that's a combination of the email address, um, you know, it could be email address, IPs, cookies, device IDs, mobile ad IDs or maids, universal IDs that are coming out from some of the platforms, postal address, just to name a few. And, you know, having all of these identifiers makes it possible to build and leverage identity-based marketing, um, you know, uh, across multiple screens and multiple devices and platforms. Um, you know, I think a good way of, of, of looking at this is, um, you know, it's so important to actually follow, the only way you could follow or identify someone in a portion of the journey and then align the right messaging to, to hit them is by actually having all of these identifiers so that you can find this person across multiple, um, you know, uh, multiple screens, or multiple platforms. So for instance, like a, a Bombas. So you think of like a Bombas, it's a great sock company. It's one of our customers and many companies like that. What they're doing is they may be doing new customer acquisition with us. So we're trying to raise brand, uh, uh, you know, raise brand awareness, purchase intent, brand favorability on the brand side, we're trying to drive that first customer uh, purchase uh, for them. And then once they purchase, now it's actually time to leverage the graph and, and, and these identifiers to then make sure they don't see any more advertising. Why waste an impression on someone who just became a customer? At that point in the, in, 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 in the journey, now we can talk about onboarding. So instead of talking about advertising messages, maybe for Bombas, which is one of the things that they do, is they talk about their philanthropic part of their business. They talk about how they're actually helping people by actually giving a pair of socks away to homeless shelter every time another pair of socks gets bought on Bombas. That is a perfect kind of welcoming message, teach them about the brand, and that's a really good way of driving loyalty. It'd be really hard to do all of this without one view of the customer. Does that make sense? For sure. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, building on your point there about building loyalty, you know, that first, there's that first step of, all right, we have to recognize the customer, but the next step is actually understand, you know, who that customer is and what are their needs and wants. Because, you know, in these days, you know, when people are being bombarded with messages in their inbox and, you know, in ads across the web, you know, if you just treat them as all customers as, as the same person, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna reach them. So, um, you need that to know who your customer is to personalize your messaging based on their characteristics and also to put their behavior into context. So first off, start by gathering all the information you can directly from a customer every step of the way. So whether that's you're asking for a birthday in the preference center or asking, you know, having someone in the call center asking for a zip code or um, you want to acquire as much first party data as you can to, to build out that customer profile. And for any gaps that you have, you can also use a third party service to fill them in. For example, for Everlane, a clothing e-tailer, you know, we help them obtain age, gender, and income data on their customer. So what can you do with that? So let's say someone buys men's pants. You know, on behavior alone, you'd say, well, that's probably you know, a male buyer and find something for himself. But if you actually know that it was a female age 38, now you have the context to say, all right, well, that's probably someone they can purchase for her significant other. And that's going to impact how you're going to communicate with her or what products you may be able to feature with her, feature her to her, uh, so not just menswear. Um, so having that information about your, about your customers allows you to talk to them better. It allows you to create more engaging, relevant messaging for them. You know, to, to, to carry on that, you know, you're talking about, um, um, you know, engaging people throughout the journey uh, in ways of making sure you're, you're, you're doing it correctly. I, I like to think, you know, lookalikes is, is, is one really good. So if we start at the beginning of the journey, um, how do we make sure that we're actually speaking to people who uh, have a high propensity to purchase, right? So that you're not missing, you know, not hitting the wrong kind of person. And I think lookalikes is a really good way of doing that. Um, you know, that's where you're, you know, taking a segment of your best customers 
Um, taking that data, um, the email address is obviously in a hashed format, um, anonymized uh, format. Putting that into a people-based marketing platform like a Live Intent or a Facebook. Um, and then using that to help calibrate the targeting so that you're actually trying to find more people that look alike or act alike um, as your best customers do. So that information can actually be extremely valuable. And then ongoing, you might do that in the beginning, but then ongoing, you can use signals that are coming off of the website as you find people that have higher purchase amounts. Um, that data can continuously be refreshing your lookalikes so that you're continuously getting better because your lookalikes might be different in the beginning of Q4 than the people that are buying at the beginning of Q1 where it's all about value and they're trying to buy all their socks for a family of five versus, you know, like, you know, just maybe, you know, buying gifts for, for, for other people. Um, so it's important that you calibrate or you change those lookalikes over time. It's not like you set it in the beginning and then that's the only lookalike file that you're going to be using for the next few years. It's something that needs to be, you know, refreshed. Um, and then also like what I talked about before, suppressing. You know, it's funny when you find silos within within teams, a lot of times the acquisition team and the retention team really aren't speaking to each other. And by having one view of the customer and working and collaborating throughout that customer journey, that is a much better way of actually managing, um, you know, managing uh, that, that customer journey. So suppressing people that are, have just become a customer, stop wasting money on impressions when it's not going to do any good. They're already customer. Uh, but you also may not want to throw out your loyalty messaging to a brand new customer. It's time to onboard them. So maybe suppress some of that loyalty or the win back campaigns or things like that would really just not be smart. So always just leading with what is the smartest thing for me to talk about right now with this customer. And it doesn't matter what part of the journey you work in. You got to break down those silos so that you're not misstepping. Um, I think that's also another you know important piece of it. I want to come back to a point you made it uh, just about you know you building up uh, interactions that'll give you a better view of that customer. And, you know, let let's think about that first time customer that shows up on a website. You're not going to have a history of interactions, but you True. still want to give them a good experience. Um, so you know, I, I just want to emphasize that's another point of you know what the importance of filling out that profile information because you want to you know you're trying to wow and engage with you customers and I mean the holy grail would be obviously one-to-one -one personalization but even if you're able to do broad broader segmentation on vendor on variables such as gender and age it's going to help you know personalized campaigns we all know yield higher open and click rates or response so you know and and similarly you know let's say you've built out a great content and differentiated strategy differentiated content strategy if you're not categorizing your customers correctly, you know you might be sending the wrong message to the to the wrong person. So getting that that data uh, straight is is really important. Um, and we, you know we we talked about earlier, you know, of the, of the different channels and the different, you know, you don't want to treat them again as different silos. So coordinating that messaging across them, um, and it, to do that, you know. I think identity matching plays an important part there because you know you need to know all right I, if I want to talk to this customer on a different channel I, well how do I reach them in in that alternative channel so you know for example with American Cancer Society you know they had a very effective direct mail program but they didn't have postal addresses for all their newsletter subscribers so they work with us to fill in those postal addresses so they can you know ACS could communicate with them via direct mail in combination with email. And that really goes on to create that sort of more of that omni-channel uh, advertising. But I think that you really- know that, That's actually a really smart point. I, I love that you're, you know, you know, when you're talking about the, the CRM team, it's just far too often that people think of CRM as really just about sending email. <laughs> you know, like let's send email, let's send more email. And by diversifying and actually have a multi-channel approach, you know, direct mail is a, is a wonderful way of actually getting people to respond to the combination of email and direct mail. And then on top of it, leveraging email. Email is not about sending email. Email is about identity. It really is. It has been. It is. It is the future of identity, the center of any any good you know identity graph. And to be able to you know send mail, do direct mail, 
and then actually take customer segments and push them into the people-based marketing platforms um, can really increase customer reach and frequency. It's not enough a lot of times to get one email, right? Or just that one piece of direct mail. It's really the combination that rises all ties. It's one plus one equals three, you know, if, if, if you will. Um, and we've actually had, you know, customers, some, some in, the, in the auto industry and, and, and many across retail, where we ask them, how many of your customers are you reaching per month in email? And a lot of times it's like 20%, 25%, based on maybe a 15% average open rate, right? And then by activating those customer segments and getting CRM messages to them across the live intent platform, and they should do the same in Facebook and others, you can go from a 20 to 25% reach in a given month to a 70 or 80% reach in a given month. And the point is, if they don't see the message, they can't do anything about it. If there's no impression, you can make no good impression. Does that make sense? For sure. And well, I guess that really sort of takes us to our next topic, you know, of getting those, you know, what happens to those impressions when third party cookies go away? And I, I think this is actually, you know, I'm glad you're, you know, here to talk with me about this because at least, you know, we come, Tower Data comes at for, more from a MarTech perspective and over, I don't think it has the same impact there as it does, you know, say necessarily to ad tech, you know, so email marketing, you know, you're still going to have those campaigns. You're still going to set up your search engine marketing campaigns as well. Those are largely unaffected. Um, you know, so our email hygiene or email intelligence services aren't really impacted by, uh, you know, the loss of third party cookies. Right. But, you know, we do, you know, as part of our identity solutions, you know, our identity matching, we, We've been doing identity matching for 20 years and not using cookies, mostly email to postal. But we do have our, our website visitor identification service, and that is cookie fix. So, like, we're helping Priceline identify anonymous visitors to their website and send those prospects personalized emails based on the car or the hotel or the flight that they search for. Today, right. you know, we're powering that by you know, cookies that we have placed in people's browser and tying that to deterministically to an email address. So that's going to go away. Um, so at least for Tower Data, how are we adjusting to that? Well, we're, we're moving to a more probabilistic model of matching identities, at least you know, uh, on for anonymous visitors on the web. Uh, so that's we're looking at going to be looking at the IP address, the device that's being used, the time of the day, the behavior of interactions, and we'll assign a confidence on how likely it is that a visitor is a particular person. And what is you know, our initial results show that we're actually going to be able to identify more users than we do today, uh, particularly because we're not currently identifying anyone on, say, Safari, which already has disabled third-party cookies. So one argument can be made, at least for us, that, you know, there might be a benefit that's pushing us to use, adapt uh, our technologies. But, you know, the, I guess there is definitely a, a qualitative trade-off of a deterministic match versus a probabilistic match. And, It'll be interesting to see how, how the industry reacts to that. I, I do agree with you that it's really, I mean, I, I mentioned deterministic data. That's when you know it's that person. Probabilistic is probably that person. And then they have confidence levels, you know, in that. And um, I think you need both. I think you absolutely need both, you know. And your deterministic data helps you calibrate or authenticate the probabilistic data. And it's very possible that your probabilistic might actually outperform your deterministic because you get more impressions that way. You can actually find that person. So as long as you can tie that first party or, or third party cookie to an email that's actually a real person, and you can do that on a regular basis, that really starts to build up confidence and allows you to get that frequency you really need to either build the brand or get that purchase. Um, so I think that's actually interesting. And, and I think it's important for us to talk about just briefly, because I don't think that's the next question, is it? Hold on. <laughs> I think that, that you know, why are cookies going away? You know, cookies already went away in Safari and Mozilla and, and a few other browsers. Um, and a lot of that was Apple's doing. And then Google's following suit is going to deprecate and get rid of the third-party cookie likely in the next year or so. Um, that's super important because this whole you know, internet experiment, you know, that's been around for 25, 30 years was actually a lot of the targeting and optimization and, and you know, so was built on the third party cookie. So it going away is going to cause, you know, all sorts of havoc across the industry if people don't prepare for it. 
And then that's why we're doing this today. It's not to scare people. It's just to say, it's not too late. It's time to think about it. There's research out there that only about a third of all brands are actually doing something about it. A third are thinking about it and one third haven't even thought about it at all. So if you haven't thought about it, it's not too late. It's still fine. You, there's a lot of great partners out there. And there's a lot of, uh, I, I think this glass is half full, meaning a lot of companies aren't afraid of it because they trust the really smart partners and people within their organization and to, to actually figure out how to, to, to you know, survive uh, in a cookie-less world or a cookie apocalypse. One area where this really will hurt, which is something what you talked about, Tom, is actually um, ID resolution on, on the website. If you're not lucky, you know, if you're not someone like a Facebook who has a 100% logged in audience, because you can't use Facebook unless you're logged in, for people that have a low logged in rate, um, that will become a real issue. And people can use, you know, services like yours. Um, we're, we've been able to actually identify users on uh, Safari for, for well over a year. Um, we've been testing Safari and Mozilla and other browsers um, to help us figure out how we can leverage our graph um, which is probably arguably one of the top five largest graphs in the country to resolve about half of the anonymous, like the, the, um, the people coming into, in, into one of those browsers. So, you know, we can do a 50% match rate against who that person really is and then let the marketer or the publisher know who that is so that one, they could leverage that information to then sell advertising at a higher premium because no targeting, they're going to lose maybe 50% of their revenue. They're, you know, you're going to see a massive drop in effectiveness and CPM allowables um, if, you, if there's no targeting. And so by doing authentication on the website and helping to authenticate um, you know, who these people are, do ID resolution, they'll be able to sell better advertising um, at higher rates. Uh, and uh, for marketers, do better personalization. And that's, again, treating people with respect, treating people like a friend would, not treating them like a stranger. And, you know, I guess, you know, I think there is a lot of promise there, you know, but uh, you know, we also see, and I, I think live intent, like tower data, you know, relies on email as the central identifier for uh, a, you know, a person. You know, the, when, you know, the email address ties all your different devices, all the different registrations uh, uh, that you do on, across the web. Um, and, you know, and for all our identity matching services, you know, that is our central match point, uh, you know, whether we're going to postal address, to mobile advertising ID, the cookie. Um, so, you know, Jason, what are your thoughts on, on Google's announcement that, you know, they're going to discourage, I guess, or using, you know, email you know, in any form as as a way of like resolving to identity. I mean they're kind of talking outside of both sides of their you know mouth but the they also we, they talk about the importance of, of brands and publishers having first party relationships um, with their customers and again there's no better way of doing that than actually at an email address level maybe someday mobile you know like phone numbers but really that that environment's just not rich enough to carry the communication and the imagery needed to get a really good message across so um i think at the end of the day you know google's doing what it thinks it needs to do to make google powerful um i don't believe it's all based on privacy but we're going to be in a much much better place um, and the, those who actually generate more, have more first party data, can activate that first party data and use it to, to create better relationships and more loyal relationships with their customers by providing real value. Those are the companies that are going to be successful. And I think what we're going to find, not what we're going to find, what we're already finding is that a lot of big brands. So think of like Kraft, General Mills, Fanatics, Walmart, um, you know, Sam's Club. These are companies that sell product, but also have an amazing audience. These, this audience, instead of selling media or, or, or content, what they're doing is they're selling their services. But then every single person has a credit card and they make purchases. Those companies are gonna be some of the best and most powerful media companies out there. Just look at Amazon. Why is Amazon the fastest growing media company uh, in history? It's because they have all that data and all that rich data on customers and what they're purchasing and, 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 and they all have credit cards. So, you know, these are the new publishers in, in the future that are coming in. Um, and I think that's uh, going to be really, really powerful. I mean, think about, just think about craft. 
I mean, what kind of relationship do you have with Kraft? None. I mean, most people are like, what do they have to offer? Well, they've been doing recipes for over 50 years, and so has General Mills. They've got tens of millions of men and women who are actually receiving the recipes every single day. That is a great way of building loyalty and a great way of actually looking at what people are cooking, what they're doing. That information can be fed into what products and services should we offer them now. Um, so I think first party data is definitely a big, a big way of, 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 of you know, mitigating the risk of the cookie apocalypse. So I think brands should start thinking about what their content strategy would be, how they can engage people with great relevant content and then use those interactions um, to de develop a better and more loyal customer. Right. And, and we've, you know, you just even in the way that our customers are coming to us, I, you know, I think they're shifting some of their spend more, you know, to that you know, identity-based uh, marketing. Uh, so, you know, even with the cookies gone, you know, people-based marketing remains the same. You know, you're, you want, your consumers want brands to recognize them across whatever channel they interact. And you know, treating your customers like strangers again is, is not a path to success. Um, so you, you know, building on Jason's point, we want you want to leverage the data that you have to target, attribute, measure, and optimize all your campaigns. So take that first party data, work with uh, partners that you have, and work with you know your trusted partners to expand your reach and get better control of your data and your the customer experience that you're providing to your customers. So I think that we need to move into questions. And uh, so let's take just a moment to take a look at uh, you know, a couple of these questions. Uh, there's one, Tom, how and when do your clients access your third party data to fill in their data holes? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we, you know, we work, there's a couple of ways to approach it. I mean, one is, when, just as you collect a, a, an email address, for example, I, I mentioned Everlink earlier. As soon as someone registers on the website, provides an email address, you know, you know, you could call a real-time API by, by ourselves or, or someone else to fill in those profile gaps. And so you get that context of who that customer is, and you can use that to inform uh, marketing that you're providing. But also, you know. You take your existing CRM, export that, or you know, use an integration we have, and and we'll process your your database in whole um, to give you a better picture of who your customers are, where they live, um, and again, what what they may interest might be interested in, so that you can create that most more personalized, relevant messaging. Perfect. Uh, this uh, comes in from Sarah Amelia Meriden. How should we be comparing providers uh, and you know, why is one company, we'll say Tower, better than a company like Audience Acuity or others? Um, why don't you take that? It did not necessarily about us, but how do you compare providers to uh, you know, help you resolve these issues? I mean, I, 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 a lot of times, like, you know, one is signal. It's one thing to have a graph or to activate this kind of stuff and, and have have data. It really is no good unless you're continuously authenticating that data. Um, so you need a lot of data coming in to keep on making sure that these people are real people uh, and that they're active. That's what you want. If it's a bunch of historical data and it's really not being cleansed and it's not you know super active and you're not re-authenticating those connections between different ids then you're going to have a real problem and then beyond that um i think you know a b testing i'm a diehard direct marketer if the data isn't indicative or of, of or, or 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 of of performance and it doesn't drive performance and it isn't actually the signals aren't predictive of performance then don't use them um, figure out which signals actually are predictive of performance. Make sure that if you're, you're leveraging machine learning for ad serving or, or AI, that you're actually plugging this information in uh, so that you can identify. You know, age and gender do a pretty darn good job of actually helping predict performance. Um, that's some of the data we use from, from Tower, and, and we've learned that it actually is predictive of performance. Um, but if you have low signal on something, you don't have enough signal on something, 
um, then it, it, it's just not going to be as, as useful. And that's why big, big data sets where you've got a really high match rate against things like Agent Jenner could be, you know, really helpful. Yeah. Um, right. So then run a bake off, you know, test one vendor, test another vendor, uh, test different data and then decide what's working and scale what does work and stop doing what doesn't work. It's going to save you a lot of money. I think, yeah, building on your point, it is a, you know, you're testing on reach, uh, you know, what it, how many identities can vendor help you resolve and then the accuracy, you know, and they, so if you have a true set of uh, customers that you, are, you already know uh, the answers for, you know, you can help to benchmark you know, then the results that you're getting from a particular vendor. Um, right. Sarah asked, uh, okay, so can I hire your company to set up this amazing retargeting for my real estate business? Um, and so the answer to that is one, it also you know, is, is a big piece of it is there's size. So for retargeting to really work and to have enough people to retarget, um, then, you know, you can't be a company that may only have 50,000 customers uh, or, you know, just even maybe 100,000 people have visited your website. You really do need a, a decent amount of traffic for this to work. Um, so, you know, you're, you're talking about in the hundreds of thousands of, of customers, uh, maybe millions of customers. And that's where retargeting really does make, a, I think, a, a huge difference and justifies the expense and cost and, 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 um, and on the time needed to set everything up. But yes, if, if, if a company is large enough, then what we can do is we can set up tags across the website, just like any other retargeting company. Uh, what you're doing is you're building up audiences. So people that hit this page and hit this page, maybe you're building an audience. Uh, against that, you know, set, um, and now you're starting to target those audiences based on the content they they viewed. If you're a retailer, uh, or you, let's say it's a real estate business, and someone actually makes it through um, a, a more critical part, they start sharing information, but then they abandon. We can absolutely set up a campaign to now trigger a retention, a, a retargeting campaign to bring them back to finish that process. This goes back to the journey. But we're going to shut off advertising probably um, and leverage the media pipes to actually get that retargeting message out there. So we're going to suppress advertising and we're really going to focus on the number one message that's actually going to help close that person. And that's the last thing they clicked on. That is always the truth. Whatever the person looked at last on your website is the thing that's going to get them back. Uh, so absolutely, we would definitely love to help you, Sarah. Um, so please just reach out. Okay. Any I other? questions i think that's it and we're just about on time so jason i want to Excellent. thank you for uh joining me here today i think we, hopefully it was a beneficial uh conversation to our audience and uh obviously we'll be providing a recording for everyone's viewing pleasure later great thank you tom thank you uh tower data team and live intent team that, that helped organize this and hope everyone has a wonderful week. Take care. Thanks for joining us, everyone.